we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. There must be a revolutionary change, a complete mutation at the very root of our being. Otherwise our problems, both economic and social, will increase. Hello and welcome to episode 113 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of carefully chosen extracts from the archives of the Philosopher's Talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti, and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is mutation. Upcoming themes are dependence, pleasure and the individual. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit our website at kfoundation.org where you can find a growing collection of in-depth articles on Krishnamurti's teachings, along with key topics and a wide selection of quotes. Our online store stocks all available Krishnamurti books and ships worldwide. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, which helps its visibility. This week's episode on mutation has five sections. The first extract is from the fourth talk in Sarnen, 1964, titled There Must Be a Mutation and It Must Take Place Now. There is, I consider a vast difference between change and mutation. Mere change will not lead anywhere. One can become very clever, superficially adaptable, adjusting oneself to environments, to circumstances, to society, to various forms of inward and outward pressures. Whereas mutation demands a quite different state of mind. And this morning I'd like to point out the difference of these two. Change is alteration, substitution of one for another. Change implies the action of will, conscious or unconscious. And obviously, considering the confusion, the misery, the starvation that exists in the whole of Asia, the oppressed, the undeveloped, all this demands a change, a radical, a revolutionary change. Not only psychological, but also physiological, outwardly as well as inwardly. There must be a change at all levels of our being to bring about a different quality, a different existence for man. I think this is fairly obvious and even the most conservative accept this, that there must be change. But most of us 
accept this obvious fact and I'm afraid we have not gone very far into the question what is implied in change and whether such adjustment, such substitution leads anywhere to any great depth or merely a superficial policy cleansing of, mo- of morality and a superficial adjustment in relationship, the moral, the ethical. Before we can go into the question of mutation, I think we ought to understand pretty deeply and thoroughly what is involved in change. To me, change, though it is necessary, must always be superficial. (coughs) I mean by superficiality an initiative of movement brought about by desire and hence by will a directive, a movement focused in a particular direction, in a particular, towards a particular attitude and action. And all motive, and all change, obviously, has behind it motive. a motive which might be personal, collective, or a motive, an ulterior motive, a kindly motive, a motive of generosity, a motive of fear, despair. And the initiative movement that springs from the background of any influence at any level must obviously does produce a certain change. I think this again is very clear, that we are, we do change under pressure. We do bring about a certain modification in our attitudes, under influence, under new discoveries, under different strains and pressures. We are very susceptible, as an individual as well as collectively, to to modify ourselves under pressure, under influence. And again, when there is a new invention, again this is fairly obvious for most of us. We do change our thoughts, orient them in a different direction by the pressure of an article, by the propaganda of an idea, like the Church from childhood insists on educating in a certain form of belief, dogma, conditioning the mind, and for the rest of our life being so conditioned We function, we abide within that limit, 
of our belief, of our conditioning. And any demand of change is within the modified limits of that belief. This again is fairly obvious. So none of us change except in how to move. Altruistic or person, limited or why? Under fear, for a reward, or for some promise of some future state, sacrificing oneself for the collective as the state, or for the sacrificing oneself to a particular idea as God. All this involves certain change brought about consciously or unconsciously. We know this. And is there any other form of change? And one sees one in this modified continuity of what has been, which is called change, we can become very clever, go to the moon, invent new things, find new new discoveries in physics, science, mathematics, and so on, so on, so on. Like the anthropoid apes, they can be, we can become extraordinarily clever very well informed, knowledgeable. And is that all? And is, does not change imply a continuity of what has been modified and being having the capacity to adjust to oneself to a new environment, to a new pressure? One sees this. Intellectually, one perceives the implications of this stupid form of change. And yet one knows inwardly, deeply, there must be a radical change not brought about through any motive, not through any any pressure, one realizes that there must be an extraordinary radical change in the mind itself, at the very root of the mind, because otherwise we are just a lot of clever monkeys with extraordinary capacities, not really human beings at all. So, having put the question to oneself, what is one to do? I see outwardly and inwardly there must be a radical revolutionary mutation. <coughs> right through one's consciousness, at the very root of our being, there must be a tearing up. Because we, otherwise we cannot solve our problems. Our problems increase more and more and more, both economic and social and relationship. <coughs> and one does need a new mind, a fresh mind, to perceive all this, 
and bring about a mutation which is not voluntarily, which is not, which has no motive. So how is this mutation to be brought about? I do not know if I am making myself clear. One can exercise will, will being desire, strengthened in a particular direction. by determination. Determination initiated by fear, reward, or the necessity of a change. But again, such action of desire, such action of will is still limited. So I see all this. I see what's going on in the communist world, I see what's going on in so-called the capitalist world and the nation. I see as an observer that there must be in the human being an extraordinary revolution, psychological revolution. <laughs> And if he has an aim, if he has planned revolution, it is still within the limits of the conscious known, and therefore it's not a change at all. Look, I can change myself. I can think differently, force myself to think differently, behave differently, stop a particular habit, reform my thinking, brainwash myself without being brainwashed by a community or by a church. I can get rid of nationalism and all the stupidities of nationalism. Those are all fairly simple. But at the same time I see the utter futility of all that, because that doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't lead to great depth of one's, from which one can live, be and function. So what is one to do? Do you understand my question? I hope I made it clear. If I made it clear, then there is the question of the problem and not making change into a problem. Because if I make an effort to change, then the effort has a motive and that initiates a certain movement in a particular direction which is desired. And therefore I see that the the question of change must not bring about a problem. I do. You understand? Because if it arises, if, it, if change implies a problem, then in that problem there is effort and there is the action of will in a particular direction and therefore such change is modification, not change at all. You then. it. 
So I see I must change. And I see that the change must come about without any effort. Because effort implies immediately bringing about a problem. And problem initiates the urge to resolve it. And the resolution is according to previous established pattern or a new pattern. So, I see the necessity of change and that it must, the change must not bring about a problem. The very movement of change must not create a problem. And I see very clearly that there must be no effort on the part of will, desire, conscious or unconscious. Because all that implies a strain, a conflict, a directive, a direction of a particular formula, a particular concept. So what is one to do? I do not know if you feel the same way as I do, that how extraordinarily interesting it is, not only intellectually, but actually. How is a man who is being brought up for two million years making endless effort to change, caught in endless misery, in despair, in fear, with an occasional flash of joy and delight. How is this entity who is so heavily conditioned for so long How is he to throw it off without effort? And the throwing it off must never become a problem. Because as we said the other day, a problem is something which we do not understand. A problem is something which we do not do not see or, or have the capacity to go to the very end of it and finish it. And so man has carried on with this issue for two million years and more. And either we change or bring about this mutation and we are we are using the wrong word, not bring about. There must be mutation. Bring up uh, this mutation must take place now or never. Because if you introduce time in mutation, then time creates the problem. I want. So there is no tomorrow for me to change into or have time at all. So I see thought is time. You understand? That is, I see the necessity of this change as a human being, 
as a part of the collective and as part of the whole, not of a particular collective, not of a particular group, as a human being of the whole human world. I see this. And I also see that time must not enter into this factor at all. Time being a thought. Thought cannot resolve this problem. I've exercised thought for a millennia, for thousands and thousands, and yet I have not changed. I carry on with my habits, with my fears, with my greed, with my envy, and the whole competitive business of existence. I have not changed. I am still caught in that. And thought has created the pattern. And so thought under any circumstance, circumstance cannot alter this. Thought as being time. So I cannot look to thought or to time. I hope I am making myself clear. So there is no exercising of will, no allowing thought to guide the change. And it is the only instrument which we have had, thought as will, as time, with which we have acted in bringing about the modification of a certain entity, a certain activity. So, Neither will nor thought as time must come into this at all. Am I making all this clear? If not, we will discuss to ask questions afterwards. So, what have I left there? I see desire with its will cannot bring about a radical mutation in myself. I have played with that for centuries. Man has played. And also man has used thought as an instrument to bring about change within himself. And again it has not succeeded. And thought as time, as tomorrow, tomorrow's demands, tomorrow's inventions, tomorrow's pressures, influences, the strain of all that, to that again I see that has not produced a tremendous radical revolution. The second extract is from Krishnamurti's fifth talk in Sanan, 1983, titled, What is going to happen to the human brain? So what is the future of mankind? What is going to happen to our brain? When the computer and robot take over, and when the great industries invent all these machineries of ultra-intelligent machines. And what's you, what's the, your future as a human being? You understand my question? This is happening. It is not something in the future. It may take ten years. And they say we'll do it in ten years. Right? And they are going to do it in ten years for commercial, 
reasons. So they are acting from the outside on the human brain. You understand? Through biochemistry, through electric currents and so on, from the outside. And they may change our condition from the outside, and probably they will. They will invent better gurus than any other guru in the world. Don't laugh, please. This is very, very serious. It sounds funny, humorous, but it is a fact. The computer will invent the best God on earth. Will bring about a society that will function mechanically. You understand? Face all this. And what is the future of man? If we, as human beings, don't change from the inner, from the inside, you understand? They are going to change you from the outside. This is inevitable. It's in the in the cards. We laymen know nothing about all this, what they are doing. Perhaps we don't want to know. And what's going to happen? to our brain, human brain, not the mechanical brain invented by top computer experts and the biochemists and the genetic engineers, acting from the outside to control the brain. Do you understand all this? And we are not painting a dark picture, it's a fact. It is happening. And what is going to happen to the human brain when we have vast leisure? Because the computer, the robot will do all the dirty work. We will build cars, we will sweep the roads. <coughs> Perhaps establish a better relationship between you and your wife. Please, this is I am not. We are, this is serious. What we are saying. It may give you all the sexual experience through computers. Yes, sir. Swallow that also. So. What is the future of man? Your theories, your particular guru, your doctrines, your churches will have no place at all, because the computer brain is much more active, much clearer, millionth of a second in answer a question. Taking all this in, not being frightened, not being depressed by it, but seeing the actual fact of what is going on, And this friend of ours, 
He's building a computer, meeting all the top people. In discussing, we, we saw what is the future of man. Our brain is now conditioned by experience, successive incidents which bring about experiences, the fears, the pleasures, the aches and the anxieties and the pain of sorrow, the death. We are conditioned linguistically, climatically. That's our condition. And if we admit that during the successive years or periods of evolution we will gradually, inwardly change, which means continue what we are almost indefinitely, which is evolution, or sudden jump, which is psychologically impossible. So what we are asking is, as two friends who are talking together, as two friends we talked yesterday with this person, we have known him for years, and also some of you we have known each other for years, and we are talking over together, amicably, in friendly spirit. These are facts, irrefutable facts. And can we, even a few, change, bring about a mutation? in the very brain cells of the, of, a, of the brain. Does it take time? You understand me? Does it take a series of incidents, successive memories, to bring about a mutation in the conditioning? You are following all this? Realising that in investigating <coughs> the conditioning, we are not investigating personal conditioning, is the conditioning of the human brain. And that brain has evolved through time, it is not your brain. So in, we are not talking about your individual mm, transformation or individual mutation that you become more enlightened, more happy, more some kind of nonsense. We are talking about the human brain, because you, as a human being, represent all humanity, you are all humanity, because you suffer, they suffer, you understand? You are, you are humanity, not just one person, isolated, individuals, secretive, concerned with your own beastly little self. Right? Now we are going to find out, if we don't radically bring about psychological revolution in the sense, bring about a mutation, (coughs) 
our brains will wither because the computer and the robot and other things that are inventing will make our brains inactive. You understand? I wonder if you understand all this. Now you have to think. You have to investigate, you have to work. That means your brain has to be active. But when the computer and the robot takes the things over, what's going to happen to your brain? Either it's going to wither or go off into some kind of vast entertainment, which is also taking place. Right? I don't know if you have not noticed what great importance they are giving to sport. The Olympics and the all that business. So you'll be caught in that. Your fellow, this is happening, sir. Or then you have to investigate whether you can, as a human being, who is the rest of humanity, if there is a radical mutation, you affect the whole of consciousness of mankind. I do not know if you have not noticed if in America or in Russia or in some remote part of Japan they invent something, the rest of the world picks it up, but it's there. You understand? It is happening. So, if, when, one or two or dozen or hundred bring about a fundamental freedom of condition, they affect the whole consciousness of humanity. Right? This is so, as Hitler has affected the whole consciousness of mankind, Napoleon, your religious leader, or the other religious leaders, they have affected humanity. So can we, after stating all this, can we bring about, not through gradual process of evolution, that's out, finished, can we bring about a, a mutation in our whole being, in our whole behaviour, in our way of looking at life? So we have to investigate together the content of our consciousness. You understand? Of which you are. Because the content makes up consciousness. Without the content, consciousness as we know it doesn't exist. Right? Are we clear on this matter? <coughs> if I am a Hindu, with all that business, with all the superstitions, with their gods, with their rituals with their, you know, with their circus, as you, a Christian, with your circus. And our faith, our beliefs, our habits, you for all that, can all that be radically brought about, bring about change, total change. And if we pursue our life, our daily life as we are living now, year after year till we die, as vast millions and billions of people are doing, 
They are not contributing anything to the whole collective consciousness of man. But if you and few of us, basically, fundamentally, bring about mutation in the conditioning of the brain, which means in the very brain cells themselves, and that is possible only when we are aware of our conditioning, meet it with head-on, Fear, all the faiths and the dogmas, the stupid rituals. Fears, pleasures, sorrow, of which we are. If there is no mutation, we will be contributing to the ugliness of mankind. So there is only one choice for us, only one direction for us, either we enter into the world of entertainment, you understand, the footballs, the literature, the painting, the talk about pictures and the cinemas and the, you understand, the whole world of entertainment, that vast industry, which is gradually taking us over. And that industry includes all the rituals of the religious people, this form of entertainment. They don't change by going day after day, day after to Mass, to, uh, to the Indian rituals. There is a temple in India, near the school where we live. It's one of the most famous temples in India. They take vows to that image inside, and they pour Bill, uh, thousands of dollars a day. It's become a tremendous business of man, like all religions. You understand all this? The churches of the world. So, when one actually sees all this spread out in front of you, like a clear map, the computer, the robot, biochemistry, genetic engineering, and the search into the activities of the brain to read other people's thoughts, on one side. The other side, vast entertainment. Unless one is extraordinarily aware, you are going to be caught in all this. You are probably are already caught. And when there is a chain, radical mutation, in the conditioning, which means freedom from all conditioning. And that freedom is love, it's not self-interest. That freedom is compassion, not si in which there is sympathy, there is all that, but compassion is not attached to any religion. It isn't because I love Jesus or Krishna or somebody that I am compassionate. I go and help the poor country. Compassion is born only out of total freedom.
The third extract is from the third talk in New Delhi, 1966, titled How Do We Bring About a Mutation? Gentlemen ask, if we accept mutation as a necessity, how are we going to bring about that mutation? Is that right, sir? Now, why do you want to accept it? Huh? If you accept it, you can also reject it, can't you? Right? And so I ask myself, I'm asking you, why do you accept such a thing? Don't you realize for yourself when you observe in the world what extraordinary misery there is in yourself and in another in the world? Don't you want to change? Not accept some idiotic idea of somebody else. So there is not a question of acceptance. There is only a question of fact. You can reject the fact, saying, well, man cannot change. He has been dumb for 10,000 years, he will always be stupid, and that's the end of it. But if the moment you observe what is taking place in yourself, in utter despair of man, of which you must be aware, if, if you see that, then you must demand then you inevitably ask the right question, which is, can man totally change? The question asks, how is it possible to bring about the mutation? Now, when you ask how, you want to know the method, don't you? The how impl implies a method, a system a way, right? The how is always that. I don't know mathematics, and I say, how am I to learn it? So you learn. There is a way, there is a method, there is a system, there is a formula, you follow that and learn it. Now, is there a system? Just listen to the words, get the feeling of the word. Is there a system to help you to change? And if there is a system, then you become slave to that system and what it promises. Therefore, it is not mutation. It's an invent. It's like those people who say, there's a method by which you, meditating, you will reach the heights. A method. Hmm? There's a method in that madness, but it's still madness. You understand? No, you don't see it, all right. So there is no method, sir. There is only attention, observation, beginning with yourself, because you are the result of the whole of human endeavour, human misery, human sorrow. All that you are, you are the result of the past whether of the past, of the community, of the race, or of anything, you are the result. And by merely asking how you are pursuing the past, which is the mechanized process of thinking. <coughs> so there is no how, but only observe with your, of yourself, observe yourself. Observe what you say. Observe, be aware of how, what you think, the motives behind it. How you treat another. How you eat. How you walk. How you look at a woman. How you look at a man. How you look at the stars, the sea, the beauty of a sunset. Be aware of all this choicelessly, and out of that comes, if you can pursue it to the very end, you will find that a mutation comes without your knowing. Yes, sir.
The fourth extract is from the second question and answer meeting in Sanan, 1983, titled With Perception There is a Mutation. And the question is asked, as the mind is outside the brain, it doesn't, the mind is not contained in the brain, but outside. I've dis- we have discussed this sometimes. They, they say yes, perhaps casually to please me, or theoretically they see, but we are talking, the speaker is talking factually for himself, right? He may be, have a hole in his head, but so he says, how can this? Perception, which is non, which takes place only when there is no, when there is no activity of thought. Then how does the brain cells, which are a material process, bring about a mutation? That's the question, right? You heard the question. May I repeat? No, you. I don't have to repeat the whole question. <coughs> Look, keep it very simple. That's one of our difficulties. We never look at a complex thing very simply. Right? This is a very, very complex question. But one must begin very simply to understand something very vast. So, let's begin simply. Traditionally, you have pursued a certain path, right? Religiously, economically, socially, morally, and so on. A certain direction all your life. I have, suppose I have. You come along and say, look, that way, your way you are going leads nowhere. It will bring you much more trouble. You will keep everlastingly killing each other. You will have tremendous economic difficulties. Right? And it gives you logical reasons, examples, and so on. But you say, no, sorry, I, you, this is my way of doing things. And you keep going that way. Most people do. Right? Most people, the 99% of the people, keep that way, including the gurus, including the philosophers, including the newly achieved, enlightened people. And you come along and say, look, that's a dangerous path, don't go there. Turn and go in another direction entirely, right? And you convince me, you show me the logic, the reason, the sanity of it. And I turn and go the totally different direction. What has taken place? You understand my question? I have been going in one direction all my life. You come along and say, don't go there, it's dangerous, it leads nowhere, you'll have more trouble, more aches, more problems. Go in another direction, things will be entirely different. Right? And I accept your logic, your statements sanely, logically, you follow all that, and I move in another direction. What has happened to the brain? You understand? Keep it simple. Go in that direction, suddenly move in the other direction, the brain cells have themselves changed. You understand? I've broken the tradition. You follow that? You understand? It is as simple as that. But the tradition is so strong, so very, very 
It has all its roots in my present existence. And you are asking me to do something which I rebel. Therefore I am not listening. You understand? But whereas I listen, find out what you are saying, if it is true or false. I want to know the truth of the matter. Not my wishes, my pleasures, but I want to know the truth of it. Therefore I'm, I'm being serious, I listen with all my being. And I see you are quite right. I've moved. Right? In that movement there is a change in the brain cells. It's as simple as that. And you got this some of Oh no, don't look so Except if I'm a Catholic or a devout Hindu, practicing Catholic and so on, you come and tell me, look, don't be silly. All that's nonsense. They're just tradition, words, words, without much meaning. Though the words have accumulated meaning. You understand? So you say, point out. And I see what you say is the truth, I move. I am free from that conditioning. Therefore, there is a change, mutation in the brain. Look, I have been brought up, we have all been brought up to live with fear. Right? We are all brought up. Not only fear of something, but fear in it. I won't going to know what the nature of fear. <coughs> and you tell me it can end. And I instinctively I would say, let's show, let's go together, find out. Right? I want to find out if what you are saying is true or false, whether fear can really end. So I spend time, I discuss with you. I want to find out, you know, learn. So my ma- brain is active to find out. Not to be told what to do. That's it. So, moment I begin to inquire, walk, look, watch the whole movement of fear, then I accept it and say, well, I like to live in fear or move away from it. When you see that there is a change in the brain. Not so simple if you could only look at this thing very simply. There is a mutation to make it a little more complex <coughs> in the very brain cells, not through any effort, not through the, um, the will, or through any motive, when there is perception. Perception is when there is observation without a movement of thought. Right? When there is absolute silence of memory, which is tough, which is thought, to look at something without the past. Do it, sir. Look at the speaker without all the remembrance that you have accumulated about him. Not his gestures, but watch him. Or watch your father, your mother, your husband, wife, girl, and so on, doesn't matter what. Watch without any past remembrances and hurts and guilt and all that coming to be. Just to watch. Then you, when you so watch, without any prejudice, then there is freedom from that which has been.
The final extract in this episode is from Krishnamurti's 10th talk in Sanan, 1963, titled Out of Mutation, There is Action. You will find when the brain is completely quiet, it is empty. Because it's only through emptiness that you, it can, anything can be perceived. You need space. You need emptiness to observe. To observe you, I must have space between you and me. And then I see, then there is see. So a mind that is crippled with sorrow, with problems, with its vanities, with its urge to fulfil and frustrated, caught in nationalism, in all the petty little things of life. Such a mind, such a brain has no space, it's not empty and therefore it's utterly incapable of observing. And a mind that's being petty, shallow, says, I must explore, it has no meaning. It must explore itself and not explore if something there is, if there is something beyond itself. So when the my when the brain is completely quiet, empty, and that demands astonishing awareness, attention, as I said, that is the beginning of meditation. Then it can see, listen, try to observe, then it will find out if there is something beyond the measure which man has made to discover reality. To this speaker there is a reality beyond the things which man has put together. But the speaker has no authority for anybody, because each one has to find out, each one has to be in a state of tremendous mutation, revolution. And out of that revolution, out of that mutation there is action, which may or may not affect society. That is irrelevant. And in the very process of uncovering yourself and discovering the whole content of consciousness, there is action. And such a brain in action is explosive, it has effect on society, whether it will or not, but it has no concern whether it has or not. Because most of us want to change society, to do something about it, want to reform it. Every reformation needs further reformation, as every change is a disintegration, is a denial, a 
of complete nutrition. We are talking of revolution, psychological revolution. And therefore, when there is that revolution, there is a total action, not action at different levels of our existence. It's a total action of with all your being. And that has tremendous effect in the world, whether you will or will not. That is again irrelevant. So a mind that is seeking reality must be in a state of constant observation and therefore never accumulation and therefore no authority. And it must also be in a state of questioning and therefore doubt, skepticism, a healthy question of everything that it feels considers important or unimportant, so that it has stripped itself of everything and stands completely alone. It's only such a mind that is innocent, and it's only such a mind that can find out if there is reality or not. 